And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Mary Everstadt, author of The Loser Letters, a comic tale of life, death, and atheism published by Ignatius Press. Welcome, Mary. Thank EWTN's you. Bookmark, it's Thank great you. to have you here. It's great to be here. And uh, the first time on Bookmark, uh, but you are an author of other books, but this is kind of the first book that's kind of fit into our, our window here on Bookmark. Uh, but some people might have seen you back in the summer when you were on with Father Benedict Groeschel, also talking basically about this concept, the loser letters. Now, I picked this up and I said, well, this must be meant for me, a comic tale of life, death, and atheism. Now, one of the things, when we talk about religion many times, especially today, people see it as serious business. There's, there's a battle out there, there's a struggle for the soul of the world, let alone the soul of the United States in many people's minds, certainly viewers of EWTN. Where does comedy or a comic tale fit in to what's going on in our society today? Well, Doug, like many people, I was permanently impressed with uh, reading the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. And what really impressed me was that he was able to make me think about things and remember things by using humor in a way that I know I wouldn't have if that had been a straight out work of apologetics. So this screw tape letters was loosely the inspiration for this loser letters. What I wanted to do was mm -hmm. deliver to this generation, uh, the Facebook generation, some combination of humor and apologetics uh, in the hopes of making them think a little harder about these issues of atheism and uh, theism and the rest of it. Okay. Now, in, in talking about that, in the, the format of, of this, now this came about as what? It started out as a long essay or an online? What, what, what exactly was the yeah, genesis of the book? Uh, thank you. The genesis was that it started as a long essay. Okay. But I realized as I was writing the essay, which I wanted to be a satirical essay, um, that there was so much material that the new atheists had, had given and sort of handed us comic material, uh, material ripe for exploitation, that I actually had a book on my hands. And so it took the form of 10 letters written to the new atheists, uh, ostensibly by an atheist convert, right, a young okay. woman. That's named AF Christian? AF Christian. A AF former Christian. Christian. Yes. Okay. And she, the book consists of letters that she's writing to the new atheists, telling them that she's uh, their most enthusiastic convert ever mm -hmm. and promising that she will give her personal story of how she converted, which mm -hmm. ultimately she does, but not before she's managed to point out a lot of holes in their arguments. Right, and in a sense she's trying to encourage them to do a better job, right, and in noting some of what she's hearing, saying, gee, in this, this area maybe you need to work a little harder to diffuse the Christian argument, right? Yes, exactly. Or saying, look, guys, there are some pretty big logical problems with the way you're arguing for this new atheism. I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, all the new atheists, like all the old atheists, talk as if religion were something invented to make people feel better, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's their ex explanation of why most of the world has believed in God, because God somehow makes us feel better about ourselves. And these illusions that we have make us feel better about our mortality. But, you know, the problem with that argument is that if you were going around designing a God to make you feel better, or if I were, certainly, I would not be designing the Judeo-Christian God right, right, because right. he puts too many rules and restrictions on me for my taste. I would design a different kind of God, uh, one who lets me off the hook for everything, for instance. So that's just one they're example. they working on him. Uh, they've been working on him <laughs> since the 60s, I believe. Or uh, maybe a few hundred years <laughs> earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. And that was a very good point in the, in the letter that you made, which I hadn't really thought about that idea. Like you said, if you're kind of, and you talk about people like Feuerbeck and those kind of people, you say uh, that's what's big swinging forebears like Ludwig Feuerbeck and Sigmund Freud would have said, that religious beliefs are illusions, fulfillments of the oldest, strongest, most urgent wishes of mankind. And you say, because that kind of a God, the Judeo-Christian God, is not remotely the kind of deity that I personally would invent to watch over me. And that was a really good point because, again, like you said, if, if you're believing Feuerbach's idea, we created God in our own image, well, then why didn't we make him a much nicer guy and a lot easier on us than than, than it seems to be what the Judeo-Christian God appears to be, or at least is misinterpreted as being? Yes. As my protagonist says, because she is a troubled 20-something girl, you know, she would have invented a God who would turn... Uh, water into Grey Goose vodka and bread into iPod minis. I mean, it's, um, again, using humor to make the point that there is a serious logical problem at the heart of the new atheist argument. 
Right, and you say, so you see this very scariness of this Judeo-Christian God is seriously bad for us. Bad for us atheists. For yeah. us atheists. Now, <coughs> in, 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 in picking up on this style, uh, as far as writing these particular letters, you, you say it's a young woman, you said 27 or in her 20s? Mid-20s, okay, yeah. Okay, now, uh, how much of that is you projecting a period of your life, or is this totally something that you just observed in the Facebook generation and, and kind of coalesce into a personality? My uh, central character, A.F. Christian, is meant to be a kind of every girl. Okay. She is the story of millions of girls uh, since the 1960s who, like her, went to a secular American campus, lost their faith, got caught up in the wider secular world, and had bad things happen to them um, because of this. Because, as it turns out, the Judeo-Christian book is a very good book for protecting young women. And when you throw out that rule book, they are vulnerable to lots of things. So in having the lead character be this young woman and tell the story, which is her personal story, uh, through this book, I'm trying to reach the many people who have been affected the way she has adversely by secularism and by the sexual revolution. And as to her particular vernacular, you notice mm -hmm. she talks the lingo of the Facebook generation. Right, Facebook There's Facebook. a lot of references to instant messaging. There's right. a lot of uh, slang, although not so much that um, older people can't follow it. Right, but exactly. Um, the reason for that is that, that this is what's in the air now, mm -hmm. and you know, we, my husband and I, have young adults. Right. We have teenagers. We have their friends in the house all the time, and that kind of patter that's right. the book's voice is something that I've been living around for years. It was very easy to just pick it up for purposes of right. the book. Now, in, in reading through the book and going through the letters, the one thing I, I wasn't necessarily, it wasn't crystal clear on was why did she become a former Christian? Was it, a, was it all of these arguments that she had taken on, which is what, the things that pulled her away? Was it, as you kind of indicate, where a lot of times it's going off to college? Was that what happened to her? Uh, what happened to her, and again, I think it's the experience of lots and lots of young women these days, um, is that she was swept up in uh, a culture with an abusive boyfriend. I can't give away too much of the plot, but mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that her boyfriend, Lobo, is not the kind of guy you'd want taking your daughter out. Right. And Lobo led her into a world of drugs and drink and other things. This is um, step by step what happens to lots of people. The reason AF Christian is running away from God is mm -hmm. that AF Christian has done things that she doesn't want to answer for. And again, I think that is a near universal experience mm -hmm. when people really want to close their ears uh, to uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, mm -hmm. to religion generally. It's usually because they've done something they don't want to answer for. Right, that's a good point. On page 24 in, in her letter, she mentions one thing that struck me in letter number one, The Trouble with Experience. I still want to reach for the Xanax just thinking about an atheist like any of you dating my hypothetical daughter as opposed to, say, a nice anti-abortion, safe sex for marriage Christian. I know it's terribly unfit, but is it that just me? So that's, a good, that's the way you kind of make the point, right, about yes. the Christian perspective. Yes, because, Doug, you know, this, this debate about atheism and theism has been taking place on a very abstract plane. Part of what I'm trying to do with the book is bring it down to earth a little bit because that is a down to earth point. When we talk about, you know, what we believe and how it influences our behavior, it is fair to ask, well, do you want a guy who doesn't believe in any religious or moral code taking your teenage daughter out? It's a pragmatic question, but I think it's rhetorically very effective because right. these big abstract ideas have real life consequences in our own lives and the lives of the people we touch. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I don't think was brought out enough in most of the discussion about atheism these days. Right. Well, one of the things right in the beginning in the, in the forward, one of the points you make, uh, if this were Facebook, no one would, would, would be friend, befriending him now, meaning God, basically, that he doesn't seem to have a lot of friends in the, in the secular culture. But, you know, the question is why? Why is academia, is it academia, why is the culture from your perspective in researching what you've seen, in writing this book, and I'm sure the insights you got, gathered even from putting this down on paper and things that you saw, why is it so? Well, I think a big part of it is the sexual revolution, mm -hmm. to be honest. I think that is um, uh, central, it's central to the book, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's also central to the way we live now. I think a lot of people... Uh, have found it irresistible. 
and it's become like a party out of control. You know, no one wants to call the police, but somebody really should. Um, in other words, the desire to live unfettered, um, sexually and otherwise, which is always there, mm -hmm. has become sharpened by the fact that people can now do so with modern contraceptives without mm -hmm. consequence, or without seeming consequence, I should say. So I think that's, that's part of it right there, for sure, is that after the sexual revolution, a whole lot of us didn't want to hear that uh, we were supposed to keep the brakes on, as the Judeo-Christian <laughs> tradition told us to. Mm. And I think that is one reason why the secular world is right. so resistant. Uh, there are others. Right. Also, uh, it strikes me that w w the trap you fall into is the negative effects usually of this kind of behavior doesn't happen right away. Yes, it's like a slow-acting virus that right, right. doesn't really hit until later in life for a lot of people. And then the person looks back and realizes why they ended up where they are, if yes. they're lucky, at least reflective. This jump ahead to letter six, do atheists know any women, children, or families? It struck me as interesting because you, you, you talked about, you kind of juxtapose Whitaker Chambers of all people, uh, there's a name people, many people would know, as well as Christopher Hitchens, also well known for his atheism, I guess uh, Whitaker Chambers was one who became a Christian. Yes. Right. Okay. And you talk about his, his child and, and looking at, I guess, his child's ear, which helped to convince him of, I guess, the Creator God. Yes. But also the part that you just mentioned on page 89, in the total spirit of constructive criticism, I think I think it, I figured out why the Brights. Now the Brights are the who? The atheists. Okay. That's what they call themselves. I didn't make that up. Well, That's what they call they themselves. They really call themselves the Brights. <laughs> yes. Have this weakness. It's because a good many atheists, both historically and today, have been childless or otherwise living outside real families themselves. And you mentioned uh, Spinoza, sometimes called the first atheist philosopher. You talk about Nietzsche, and then you talk about Rousseau. But then you go on to mention, of course, that Rousseau did have kids. But he did what with them? Uh, he had five illegitimate children and sent them all to orphanages where, from the best that historians can tell, they all died. Now, the point in bringing that up right. is not to say, of course, that atheists are bad people or atheists can't have families. It's nothing like that. The point is deeper than that because if you look at the world, if you look at the history of philosophy, it is striking, I think, that the major um, atheists throughout history have been childless mm -hmm. or living apart from a family. Why does that matter? It matters because for a lot of people, I believe, mm -hmm. um, the experience of having children is what brings them to religion or brings them back to religion. And that's why I quote Whitaker Chambers there. Right. It's very interesting because Whitaker Chambers was, of course, a communist and uh, an atheist and uh, a lot of other things too. And his road back to religion uh, turned out to start with studying his infant daughter. Mm -hmm. And he writes in a beautiful passage that I quote there that right. it was studying her ear and right. her face and it was in looking at her that he realized he could not have created this. Something else had to create it. And he says, and that was the moment that the finger of God was laid mm -hmm. on my forehead. Now Christopher Hitchens right. takes this same passage and quotes it to make fun of it and also talks about uh, his daughter's ear and how it's nothing like a, a sublime experience studying his daughter's ear and he makes fun of his daughter's ear and of course he's having fun with this idea. But my point to the reader is which description resounds more with the parents of the world or for that matter with anyone who's ever been in charge of children and I submit it is the description of Whitaker Chambers. Mm -hmm. Now why does that matter? Does that prove God exists? Of course it doesn't prove God exists but it does prove that somewhere deep inside us at our most um, at our most sensitive, that is, as parents, as our, at our most sensitive to the needs of others, when we study creation, we feel as if this, we feel this deep awareness that something else made this. It couldn't have been us. And something about the experience of children connects us to the divine. Right. I think that's an experience many people have. Right. Do all people have it? Obviously right. not. But I think that would resonate with most people. Mm -hmm. uh, on page 20, there's a quote that just says, secularism is as secularism does. What does that mean? What that means is that when uh, the new atheists and when secularists generally talk about our world, you know, in their storyline, we've had unremitting progress, right? Up till now, mm -hmm. it's been one emancipation after another. It's been women and it's, um, you know, been uh, 
history of slavery is behind us, and we've made material progress, women in the workplace, women able to control the size of their families, their fertility, et cetera. One liberation after another, now gay liberation. And my point is, no, that is not what the history of secularism looks like. It doesn't look like things get happier every year. If you really look at the empirical record, what you see is that alongside the emancipations they talk about, um, being emancipated from God, essentially, has also led to broken homes on a record scale, um, fatherless homes on a record scale, uh, lots of abortion, plenty mm -hmm. of that, uh, lots of things that people regret doing later in life. So it is not a record of unremitting progress. It's a record of trouble and heartache that is not looked at closely enough. And again, it's been the experience of millions and millions of people. So it seems fair to hold that to the light and say, no, this is what secularism um, uh, without uh, amelioration by mm -hmm. religion really looks like. Right, right. In uh, letter number three, the trouble with good works you say, and if the Catholic Church has been the cake, I need you to explain that, some of the Protestants have been the perfect frosting. What does that relate to? <laughs> well, that um, is a reference to the very well-known fact that um, we have sinners in the Catholic Church and we have sinners all over Protestantism. But the fact that there are sinners and scandals in these various religious institutions does not invalidate the mandate of those institutions. And this is another logical flaw in the atheist argument as if pointing out the hypocrisy of some Christians could possibly undermine um, the, the, the greater meaning of what Christians are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, as G.K. Chesterton says, the Christian is different from everybody else only in that he's supposed to be better. In other words, you wouldn't call an atheist a hypocrite because an atheist doesn't believe anything to be a hypocrite about. But the atheists get to point their finger at the Christians whenever we fall down and say, okay, hypocrite. Mm -hmm. But as if calling someone a hypocrite answers anything, it doesn't. And that's why I talk about it. Well, I think it. it also has to do with maybe uh, a misunderstanding of hypocrite. I mean, uh, you know, everybody, you can espouse good things and still fall. Our Lord fell three times on the way to, you know, Golgotha. So it happens. The, the difference is, do, do you mean it when you're saying it? Are you attempting to do the right thing? You might make a mistake and fall. That's not being a hypocrite. A hypocrite is saying one thing and clearly doing another, basically like an actor, right? Yes, yes. And I think it's also fair, the flip side of that coin, it's, just, it's fair to talk about how believers do good things in the world. Right. And there is a whole letter in there that's full of what I think is fascinating empirical evidence um, showing that people who believe in God mm -hmm. give more to charity, right. donate more of their time, volunteer more, they even donate more blood than people who do not believe in God. And this is substantial mm -hmm. research um, that I think should be brought to the light. Now, does that mean that all people who believe in God are good? Of course sure. it doesn't. Does it mean that all people who don't are bad? Of course it doesn't. Right. I have to keep making that point right. because people get confused. But um, what it does mean is that believing in a religion that tells you mm -hmm. you have an obligation to take care of the weak and the sick and those who can't take care of mm -hmm. themselves, that belief actually has effects in the real world and they are good effects. And I defy the atheists and secularists of the world to say, no, that's not good. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that you say, equally annoying are the people who argue, this is in the letter, that the record doesn't support your claim that Nazis and communists and whatnot were really somehow religious underneath. You know, as if Paul Abdul on American Island was secretly a fat, bald, male teetotaler. <laughs> well, this is another logical problem for atheism, is that they want to run like hell from the history of the last century, because that is a history in which real believing atheists were in charge of some pretty central governments, and the result was Holocaust and the Gulag Archipelago and millions and millions of um, deaths brought on by atheist beliefs. Now, does that mean that all atheists, right. you know, want to get into power to do those things? No, but it means that, again, there's an empirical historical record of what atheism empowered can do right. when it is unfettered from uh, any moral code that says otherwise. And it is fair to bring up that record. Now, they try to get around it by saying, well, actually, you know, Hitler somehow was kind of like a, a neo-pagan who really believed, you know, some kind of spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. and 
I don't know what they say about Stalin. I mean, he's pretty hard to explain. No, you can't explain this away by saying, well, these guys were all sort of secretly religious. They were what they said they were. They should be taken at their word, and their deeds mm -hmm. should be taken uh, at their worth. Well, well, it's good to always point this out because you hear this canard all the time about more people have died in you know, yes. over religious conflicts than, you know, well, you have at least 100 million people last, in the last century over the last 100 years who have died due to Nazism and communism in China and yes. St under Stalin, Pol Pot. I mean, I'm not here to defend the Inquisition, right. but I am here to point out that yeah. these guys always bring up the Inquisition as if that somehow answers yeah. the, the, the historical crimes of atheism when it's gotten to run part of the world. Mm -hmm. These are apples and oranges. They shouldn't be compared, but, you know, the new atheists have been constantly uh, acting as if there are, the body count is somehow higher in religious warfare. It's not true. Right, without a doubt. In letter four, uh, the question is, who are the dull people, and, <laughs> but what's wrong with their art? The trouble with dull art. That is a letter about a very different subject. I, I should explain that dull, capital D, is right. used in the book to um, refer to Christians. And the reason is, again, that the atheists have been referring to themselves as Brights, capital B, which I find a kind of condescending mm -hmm. <laughs> label that um, I, I try and make a little fun of. Letter four about dull art concerns the following fact. On any serious aesthetic um, appreciation of human history, all of the greatest art, and talking about music, sculpture, um, painting, uh, literature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of the greatest art humanity has produced has been produced in the name of God, or the gods in the case of classical antiquity. Y you could probably work really hard and find an exception here or there, but I think most reasonable people would agree that that statement is defensible and even intuitively correct. All the greatest work of art has been created in the name of God. Now what does that tell us? Once again, we haven't established by that fact that God exists. But we have established that when the new atheists and the old atheists try to wipe the whole field clear of religion, um, they are taking, they run the risk of taking with it the greatest aesthetic achievements uh, that humanity has produced. And I think th that, again, is an interesting point. If religion is nothing but a toxin, mm -hmm. right, if it's nothing but bad for people, and bad for the world, then how could it be that this aesthetic record is what it is? Mm -hmm. It's another problem for atheism. Mm -hmm. In uh, one of the letters later on in the book, it's uh, letter five, those obnoxious Christian convert traitors and what to do about them. Y you, you talk about the, why can't we atheists snag somebody high profile, and I guess uh, like that referring to, I guess it was Bernard Nathanson's conversion to, to Christianity. Uh, maybe we should start a TV show called America's Top Atheists, where the winners get to burn books by enemy religious converts. Do you think that might help? <laughs> now, what, what's <laughs> the point of that? The point is, uh, seriously, the, there is a grand centuries-long, well, millennia-long tradition, beginning with a guy named Paul, mm -hmm. of a pretty uh, sophisticated, worldly people converting to Christianity in particular. And it's an unbroken chain that stretches over 2,000 years, and it includes some of the greatest minds of history, uh, like a guy called Augustine, and a whole bunch more. What's the point of that? The point is that the atheists actually can't produce anything like that on their side. Um, you know, in this public debate that they started, um, uh, they have managed to make it sound as if all the IQ points in history are on their side, and that it's just a matter of being smart enough and liberated enough uh, to understand that this whole God business is a, a fraud. Once again, I think the record needs to be righted there. Mm -hmm. Look at the history of religious conversion. It's why I name a bunch of these people by name. Right. Um, some of the greatest minds of England, uh, 75 years ago, uh, among other places, you find these concentrations of people. Uh, Again, worldly, sophisticated people. We're not talking yeah. about people who are the caricatures right. that Mortimer atheists Adler, say. Adler, Claire Booth Luce, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, Alec Guinness. And people who went on to do some great things mm -hmm. in the world as Christian converts. Mm -hmm. um, e. If Howard Hunt, now there's one <laughs> I didn't know about. Yes, the history of conversion <laughs> is full of surprises. <laughs>
You also say near the end of the book, one of the last letter number 10, um, something about a midget in a red cape, apparently. Uh, you say, why if evolution is right and the loser is wrong, the Christian, should there be any place in the otherwise oh-so-sophisticated scheme of natural selection for a trait as useless and powerful and inefficient and self-destructive as human guilt? Why do you bring human guilt up? Well, uh, A.F. Christian's story wow. turns on human guilt. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, I, I should mention that these letters are being written by her from a rehab mm -hmm. center where she's gone. It's not her first rehab, but she's back. And uh, there's a lot going on in her life that becomes clear in the course of the book. Why does human guilt matter? Because it is, uh, as the Catholic Church understands and the atheists do not, it's one of the most important things about us is that we feel this mm -hmm. uh, when, when natural law is transgressed, when the moral law is transgressed. Mm -hmm. We feel guilty inside and we are motivated by that guilt in different directions. For some people, uh, it sends them running to the church. For other people, it sends them running away from it as fast as they can go. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's a lot of the impulse for secularism in our world, again, is that of a lot of people feel that innate sense of having transgressed, but they, they don't want to be held to account for it, and so off they go in another direction. I also believe this is part of why the new atheism and secularism generally is as overtly hostile yeah. to believers as they are. I mean, after all, if it, believing in God is just like believing in the tooth fairy, yeah. then they should leave the rest of us alone, yeah. right? Because who so cares? Upset? Who right. cares if you don't right, believe exactly. in the tooth fairy? Right. But they care very much, and I think that speaks to the resonance right. of natural so. law. Right. We're just out of time, Mary. Thank you so much for being Thank here you. on the program. Good luck with the book. Thanks for having Speaking me. Speaking here with author Mary Eberstadt about her work, The Loser Letters, a comic tale of life, death, and atheism, published by Ignatius Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.